I am Dracula. I bid you welcome. Oh, it's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Thou shalt rise again. Power to make multitudes run squealing in terror at the touch of my little invisible finger. Do you believe in werewolves? To a new world of gods and monsters. <laughs> Hey everybody, and welcome back to our retrospective on the Universal Monster Classics. Chad, I am so excited. What are we talking about today? We are talking about one of your personal favorites, 1941's The Wolfman. You know, it's so funny to me that, well, you know, it's not even that funny because he's so iconic. It's interesting to me that this one came out 1941 10 years after Dracula and Frankenstein, nine years after The Mummy, and yet he immediately, almost, it seems like he immediately became the other iconic monster to join that group. Why do you think this one was so iconic? That's what I was just about to ask. I was just about to ask you the same question. I was going to say, what was it that made this character appear, come back, you know, in um, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, whereas... After Werewolf of London, we never saw that character or that iteration of a were- of a wolf character ever again. Well, okay, so something we have to call out, I think, is great, great, I mean, whole cast of actors. First of all, Lon Chaney Jr. playing the Wolfman is the son of, of course, one of Universal's first cash cows, Lon Chaney Sr., but, I mean, my God, the whole Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman, uh, Ralph Bellamy as uh, one of, as Colonel Montford, uh, Claude Rains as his dad, which <laughs> we'll talk about how why that's absurd, uh, Bella Lugosi mm-hmm. as Bella, very creative name there, Mar- and I know, and I've heard this name plenty of times, Maria Uspinskaya as Maliva the Gypsy Woman, and Evelyn, or Evelyn Anchors as Gwen Conliffe. All fantastic actors. And I think that's something, speaking along of, with... I, speaking of that I think real that's quick. something, re- real quick, I think that's something that uh, Werewolf of London was missing. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I was just going to say, no, with you rattling off um, the, the cast in this movie... That made me think, was this the first one that did the roll call with showing everybody at the beginning of the I movie? I think so. It's the only one I can think of. Yeah, because all it. the rest of them just had, you know, like, you know, the paintings with the music and the names, you know, like the crew, the cast. This one, yeah. it was like, boom, it showed everyone, which mm-hmm. worked and didn't work because okay. I liked it because it almost felt like you know like the end of a play where they you know bring mm-hmm. everyone out and show you who everyone is and they do the bow yeah right but at the same time it's almost like did we need it if that makes sense like we could have just been introduced to the characters whereas here it's like here is everybody you are going to see and here is what they look like i dig it i like oh, i'm it. fine with it i'm just wondering like is there, is like is there a certain sector out there who's like it didn't need to happen? I mean, because it, it feels like a. I'm sure there were other movies that did it first, but at least for this Universal Monsters box set, this was the first time we saw it. Hmm. Um. My God, there are so many things I want to say about this movie. Um. So, okay, I alluded to it before. How the hell is Claude Rains the father of Lon Chaney Jr. in this movie? <laughs> Unless. Unless uh, Lawrence Talbot's mother was like eight feet tall. I don't see it happening. He was like a foot, foot and a half taller than him. He towered exactly. over him. But you know what? Claude Rains, and I gotta give him credit here, has a has a very commanding presence. And you know, very much speaks to his son like in an authoritative way. He, I could have seen him being in like military type movies almost like he seems like the type who would have played like the commander of an army or something like that yeah absolutely well he was an inspector in uh casablanca so okay yeah um another thing i want to say 
you know what, Chad? I'm just going to tell you this right now. If I could have one movie prop from any movie, can you guess what it would be? Uh, the walking stick. The silver wolf's head cane. That thing was I could have... looking. Yeah. Now, in the movie, that thing was made out of rubber. Rubber. But they have actual replicas where you can get it made out of real silver, which would cost you an arm and a leg. Or... <laughs> just like made from aluminum or something so mm-hmm. i would love to get one of those canes something to save up for yeah absolutely <laughs> um but okay another thing i want to talk about is um and let me know if i'm hogging the conversation or if you want to bring anything up but uh the poems that's in this movie even a man who is pure in heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright it added a bit of it felt like it added a bit of artistry to it but it also mm-hmm. felt like it definitely like um it felt like it worked with the lore where it was like mm-hmm. this is a world where these poems are things said and known by people yeah and it's like it, that had to have spawned from something not just oh, werewolves are a myth. It's like, well, I mean, you don't see like, okay, in the world we live in, you don't see people wandering around saying poems about beware the woods because of fairies or something. Right. Well, that's actually so funny because um, a lot of people thought that that was, when that, when this movie came out, a lot of people thought that that was some classic poem. But no, it was just something that uh, Kurt Siodmak, the writer, made up. Oh, I didn't know that either. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was that- some famous poem. No, he just made it up. But the other poem that I can't recite entirely that I really love and I think is really haunting is the one that Maliva says, the the way you walked was thorny through no fault of your own, but as the river enters the soil, I can't remember the whole thing. The one she says but, when uh, they're dying? Yes. It's really, it's haunting and it's kind of tragic, like when she looks at her dead son, who actually, Bela Lugosi was older than Maria Uzminskaya. Wow. <laughs> they just got the whole parent dynamic totally wrong here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um but it adds like a sort of tragicness. Like you can tell how sad she is that she has to relieve relieve these people's souls, you know? Yeah, and at the same time it's like relief it's like sorrow that her son is gone, but also like relief like that his curse has ended. His curse has ended, and he doesn't have to live his life anymore knowing he's murdering people yeah. when he's not in control. I think the... <laughs> go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was going to say something I did notice that I wanted to ask you about was... So when, when Bella was a wolf, and he was attacking um, Jenny... Mm-hmm. All we could really see was like the wolf's head on the side of the tree. Yep. So did Bella become a wolf and then Lawrence became a wolf man? So you are not the first person to bring that up. I actually listened to commentary from some film historian that's in one of those you know, that's in those documentaries for all these movies. But some film historian was talking about this. I think it was Scott McQueen. But he said a common question is, okay, why is it that, you know, Bella the gypsy becomes, you know, a wolf creature, whereas Lawrence Talbot becomes a wolf man? Now, the explanation that's often given is originally this movie was meant to be a lot more psychological and you were never going to see the wolf man. Okay. It was all going to be left to your interpretation if he's really becoming this creature or if it's all in his head but they wanted to make a buck and they knew showing the monster would do it more so that's the explanation that a lot of people give is you know again they weren't originally going to do it but i would think if you're going to show him then okay then make the creature that attacks gwen or attacks jenny i'm sorry see actually be a wolf man i don't know if i buy that though because there's no way they arbitrarily decided after filming that scene we're going to design um, Lon Chaney Jr.'s makeup for his Wolfman. There's mm-hmm. no way they could have decided that and then come Still up with how that. they're going to do it. Because 
the way his makeup, it obviously took hours to apply, but it probably took a long time to come up with exactly how the design was going to be. So see, yeah. I mean, I, I like I could, I, if a professional said the reason you just said, I'll believe it, but I'm still going to throw that question out there of, so they filmed that scene and then after that they decided to come up with the Wolfman makeup. I find that almost mm-hmm. hard to believe. I agree. I I would think if they ultimately decided to give him the Wolfman makeup and make him the Wolfman, I would think they would want to shoot that prior scene with an actual Wolfman attacking. And they were going to need somebody or who had a, Jenny. And they were going to need somebody with a pretty decent physical stature too. Otherwise, I'm sure they could have gotten somebody who was like the same size as uh shoot his name just fell out of my head Bella Lugosi no not Bella uh the guy who played Jamie? Fritz in um oh um uh Dwight Fry Dwight they could have gotten someone who had like I'm not saying Lon Chaney's Jr.'s acting was bad but I'm saying if you wanted it to be more psychological I almost could have seen them getting a more of a Dwight Fry to do it but Dwight yeah. Fry also was not physically he was nowhere near the same size as Alon Chaney Jr. So it's like, I almost would not have been afraid of him in the Wolfman makeup. So it's like, mm-hmm. they chose Lon Chaney Jr. I think for his size. They had to have. I would, I would say so. Um, what do you think of his Wolfman look? It is beyond iconic. I mean, it's, it's, it's so literally perfect. right there with Bela Lugosi's Dracula and Boris Karloff's Frankenstein. Absolutely. Now, you know what's funny is, have you heard the two things that you would expect to see in a werewolf movie that you do not see in this movie? I know one of them is a full moon, and I don't remember what the other one is. The other one is you do not see a full-on man-to-wolf transformation. Yeah, You see his feet transform, and then at the end, after he's died, you see him transform back into a man. Mm -hmm. But you do not see a full man-to-wolf man transformation. That's because the best man-to-wolf transformation transformation is still werewolf in london or an american werewolf in london american werewolf in london (laughs) yeah which was 50 years after so and yeah that is just i still stand by that one that one is still one of the best and i'm sure i'm gonna get shit for this and i don't care i love watching van helsing transform into a werewolf and hugh jackman's um (laughs) van helsing yeah well that one was interesting because it was um the beast sort of came from within. And, right. I mean, and it was all flesh. CG. It was all CGI, but it's like, I don't care. It was still cool. <laughs> yeah. I love that movie. <laughs> now, one bit of acting from Lon Chaney that I really want to call out here that was really great is when he sort of goes to that carnival and they're playing the game where they're shooting the animals and then the mm-hmm. wolf comes up and sort of traumatizes him. I, I think he really does the... just the trauma of everything going on around him. He does it really well. I mean, this movie is another one. It's definitely a tragedy. You feel bad for this poor yes. man who just came home after years of being away and within 24 hours gets bitten by a werewolf. It's like, yeah. And he wasn't like, he wasn't the type of character who's like an asshole where it's like, yeah, he got what he deserved. It's like, what's yep. wrong with him? He's just being nice. I, I mean, he didn't know that um, Gwen. Uh, was already had a fiance at that point, did he? He didn't find out until later. Oh, right? he, that's right. He didn't know until later, um, until after she agreed to go out with him. But also, in her defense, she had her friend Jenny come along, so it wouldn't seem like a date, I guess. Yeah, but then both but, of them needlessly just shrugged her off like she meant nothing and left her. The poor woman. Yeah. They just left her in the middle of a gypsy camp. What great friends. Also, also, I want to call into question how how forward thinking was Bella in this movie? It's like, so it's like, okay, so if you know you're a werewolf, it's a night of a full moon, the sun's going down, it's getting dark, and you are just open running for business. You'd think he'd have asked his mom to chain him to a chair. Exactly. Or you know what I always wondered? (laughs) What happens if, I mean, I don't know how extensive your knowledge is of werewolf lore. What if like, they like, knocked him out drugged him or like got him like completely wasted and he just like passed out at like eight o'clock before the full movie even comes out 
I if would he's imagine like he was drunk off his skull and passed out on the floor, is anything going to happen? I imagine he would probably turn into the furry creature, but would still just be knocked out. <laughs> also, well, I want to ask you. I want to ask you your opinion on this. I've always said, I feel like being a werewolf probably in real life wouldn't be that bad if you know it's going to happen. I feel like you know what, just have like a bunch of chains in your basement. You know the full <laughs> moon is coming. Chain yourself up. Have give someone you trust the key, and they just have that responsibility once a month. Toss you <laughs> some. Toss you some raw meat so you can keep yourself satiated that night. You'll imagine, be fine. imagine what your neighbors would think once a month as they hear screaming and howling. And howling, and yeah. <laughs> you just tell them that oh, I was watching a horror film. Every month on the night of the full moon, you watch a horror film. Yeah. Yeah, it's this weird tradition I got. Do you have a problem with it? <laughs> yeah, come on. I will say it though. Do you want to know another cool werewolf design though? We mentioned this, I think, two episodes ago. The Wolfman in the Monster Squad. Oh yeah, great design. Every we Wolfman's need to talk about arts. that movie. The, the Wolfman's got arts, and that movie did answer that you can you can only kill him with silver. You cannot yes. blow him up because he'll just come back together. <laughs> that scene was ah, oh, that whole movie is amazing. Uh, but so good. sticking with this one, um, no, I just but yeah, sticking with what he said about being a tragedy. It's just like every scene past him getting the bite and becoming, getting the werewolf Mm -hmm. infection. It's just like, you just feel so bad for this man. Like that Gwen and her fiance are trying to, the the fiance obviously has a little animosity animosity towards him, but he's still Mm -hmm. trying to be respectful. Gwen is being polite. And he just has a look on his face of just pure, torture and misery and you just feel so bad for this man who's done really nothing wrong he tried to save a woman's life and yes it wound up costing him his it was just a a real case of just being in the wrong place at the wrong time Mm -hmm. and you know it's funny it's good that uh, thank you for bringing up for continually bringing it up that it's a tragedy because that reminds me of something i wanted to say is that the Wolfman is like, I think another thing that makes him so interesting, it makes him a lot more, not maybe not more interesting, but a different level of interesting from Dracula or Frankenstein or the Mummy is, you know, they're that monster all the time. They have no other personality, you know, whereas the Wolfman, he is our protagonist and the monster in one character. And I think it was actually Stephen Summers. <laughs> Um, when he was talking about making Van Helsing, it's just like, what makes the Wolfman interesting is it's almost like he's a drunk or a drug addict. It's just like, you know, during the day, he could be your best friend, but when night comes and his demons come out, it's not going to be good. It's almost like, uh, it's almost like an animal version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah. Yeah. It's just... I really love that whole angle of it, of that, like I said, just the, he's our protagonist and our monster rolled into one. And so you, and it creates this drama of like, I don't want him to die, but I don't want all these other people to die either. And like you said, we do, we feel bad for Lawrence throughout the entire movie. Mm -hmm. And then when you do see him, you do fear this monster. Yeah. Like you, I think you said it, two episodes ago there's no running from this thing yeah exactly the wolfman is a fast creature and i like how uh it's almost like we talked about earlier the difference between bella being a wolf and uh lawrence talbot being a wolf man um it's like there's no there's no outrunning this thing Mm -hmm. he's going to catch you (laughs) yeah oh and oh my god i love the wood like the woods scenery of this movie just the Mm -hmm. fog on the ground and also when the one character i forget who it was but the one digging the graves it's just a there's a graveyard and there's just fog all around the scenery in this is ah so good brings me right back to the original frankenstein yeah it's just like the cemetery with the fog rolling in and the dead trees yeah 
But one thing this movie has that Dracula and Frankenstein didn't is the score. And I just love that that sort of that that three note score that you get for the Wolfman, the da na na, you know the one. Mm-hmm. Actually, um, it's, I was gonna say this for the end, but I'll say it now. Do you want to know what my first memory of this movie is, and the first time I saw part of this movie? What is it? The movie Beethoven. Really? Have you ever seen that? It's been so long. I was a small, small child. It was randomly one of the nights where like Beethoven was just walking around the house and he turned the TV on and the Wolfman was the movie that was on the TV. And there was the scene where the dad came downstairs to turn the TV off and it was when the Wolfman was prowling through the woods and it was playing the da 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 the up and down part of the score yeah. and it just always stuck with me that music yeah and then like when he's like running towards Gwen and like grabbing her it's, it's how's it sort of go let's give me one second here there's the da 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 like ah mm-hmm. oh. the music was great for this film it yeah. worked also, so well like that music also, when he was transforming was just so like this poor man. Yeah, I feel like a lot of horror movies <clears throat> don't want to do like a full score like that. They'll just sort of do the psycho, you know, the rain, 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 or they'll just have like a low hum a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. But like these classic monster movies had a lot of these just full booming scores, you know? absolutely and it works i mean a foot like there's time for the quiet moments the quiet music but there's also times when it's like a full-on orchestral score helps bolster what you're seeing it's uh like that's why there's whole movies that are made with just music and no words because the music can sell the emotion And like that, we didn't need to see, like when Lon Chaney was, when Lawrence was first becoming the Wolfman, we didn't hear him talking while looking at himself getting all hairy. We didn't hear, no, what's happening to me? Oh my God, am I going to kill someone tonight? The look Mm -hmm. on his face, the music playing, the visuals we saw, that was all we needed. And Mm -hmm. And like that, we, we could, they could, it would not have worked without the music. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I will say one thing that sort of held these older movies back is, you know, during that transformation, just doing the cross dissolves isn't the most convincing, but it's what they had for the time. Um, But I mean, John Landis, when he was making an American werewolf in London, he said, I always imagine that, you know, turning into a werewolf would be a very painful process because your bones are reshaping and Ugh. all this. I imagine it would be an agonizing and you wouldn't sit there still, you know, but I mean, I think it's still a pretty cool effect for the time and it's what they had available. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Like we said, it's, well, it's the same principle as the lion in the wizard of Oz. He wasn't yeah. going to walk around on all fours, the whole film. Same as Lon Chaney wasn't going to, I'm sorry everyone would have laughed if instead of him prowling through the woods coming up over that branch and the first shot of his face if we saw him like trying to walk on all fours people would have been laughing yeah and to this day we'd still be laughing we'd be like and he that this probably would have been it there probably we probably Mm -hmm. never would have seen this character again because people would have been like that's hilarious look at this man crawling through the mist yeah but thank God he did come back in uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, House of Dracula, House of Frankenstein, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. We saw him plenty, but um, there's one, there's at least one more thing I want to bring up, but is there anything in particular you want to call out still? Um, I think the only thing I was thinking about was they alluded a lot to the beast within and a lot more psychological stuff but mm-hmm. it feels like they just didn't tap into it because of like you said if this was originally meant to be more psychological all of those lines of dialogue would have made more sense but they said mm-hmm. it and then the payoff was it's not psychological he is 
he is a man who turns into a wolf and kills people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know, but that's I just... think maybe that was to a... I mean, I feel like we didn't hit that psychological point until Psycho, which yeah. I don't want to say this scene ruined it, but the scene over it uh, explained it was that in that doctor at the end of the movie. At uh, the end of Psycho, yeah. At the end of Psycho, where they just explained all of it to you, where it's like we could have figured it out in our brains. Whereas this one almost did the opposite. They alluded to so much psychological stuff, but then none of it was psychological. Never fulfilled it. Yeah, maybe they would have had more scenes sort of paying that off if they didn't include the Wolfman, but. Uh, ultimately, I'm glad they included the monster scene. Oh, and, and it's iconic. It's uh, I 100% agree. I'm glad they did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I really want to call into is the tragedy is the tragedy of the end of the movie of uh, Sir John having to kill his son. Just, this movie is so filled with tragedy. It's it's Maliva losing her son. It's Larry not being able to save Jenny. It's the tragedy of him turning into this monster and killing all these people. And it's the tragedy of Gwen losing this new friend of hers and Sir John having to kill his own son not realizing it. All of it could have been avoided if Lawrence had just never come home. (laughs) Or come home a few days later. If he never came home and also... If he wasn't using that telescope to be a to be a creep, that's so true. <laughs> the, and what are the uh, odds that when he does zoom in on a room, she is fully dressed? Yeah, right. <laughs> Only um, because it was 1941. If that had been filmed today, I'm sure she would have been naked or in a bra. Yeah, exactly. But we didn't need it because Evelyn Anchors was gorgeous as Gwen. <laughs> Yeah. However, apparently, a few bits of trivia for the background. Apparently, Evelyn Anchors and Lon Chaney Jr. did not care for each other in real life. Really? Yeah, apparently they were annoyed with each other. Was it? So what? Would, so coming off of that, what was both of their personalities like? Did he have a strong personality? I, I, I just remember hearing that in the commentary, and I it's been a while since I listened to the commentary. I don't remember everything. Okay. Um... But that's one thing. Also, the dog that they used for the Bella Wolf scene was a German Shepherd named Moose, and it was actually Lon Chaney Jr.'s dog. Okay. Yeah. It actually it wasn't you... originally. He adopted the dog after that scene. Oh, so it was just a dog for the movie, and then he adopted it. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah. I've heard other stories like that too in movies where like they'll put animals in, and then somebody in it is like. They're like, oh, what are you going to do with it? I don't know, take it back to the pound? I'm taking it home. Yeah, exactly. A dog but... named Moose. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to throw in that trivia. Is there anything else you want to say about this one? It's a great film all around. I love it. It's so so great. And like we said, it came out about 10 years after the others, and yet he joined their ranks. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, if you don't have anything less left to say, you want to close, uh, we can close it out. Wraps it up for me. Cool, cool. Everyone, uh, as you can tell, we both just gushed over this one. Uh, if you loved it as much as we did, or if you have different feelings, share them below. Let us know what you think. Uh, this is Ken. I was happy to take the reins on this one. Take it easy, everyone. Have a good night, guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back soon.